Greetings and Merry Christmas slash Happy Holidays, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, tis the season of giving, and what better time to give unto you all than this review that I have had on my backlog since... Uh... Oh, August last year, huh? Well, better late than never. Today's very special subject is a big favorite among many of my followers. Transformers for the PlayStation 2. Oh, not that one. This one right here. Yes, it's a bit confusing that two games with the same name that came out relatively around the same time, but most people are probably more familiar with this one. This one was only released in Japan. For the record, this game is real for the numerous people who ask questions or believe it doesn't exist in physical format for some reason. Here it is, in my hand, a legitimate copy I got years back when I first learned of this game. First published on October 30th, 2003 by Takara and developed by Winkysoft, whose library of notable titles don't seem to cover much, and of course they went bankrupt in 2015. As stated, this game never made it out of Japan for reasons I'm not totally clear on, but I can speculate one major reason being the title and release window being too close to the other Transformers game on the same console that would be released a few months later in February 2004. To this day, this game has not seen any re-release outside of a The Best Takara version that came out in May of 2004, meaning the only legitimate way to get a hold of this game is by importing either of the old releases. Furthermore, because it's a Japan region exclusive game, you would also need to have a means of playing Japan region games, and my method for doing so would be the Swap Magic Disc and Flip Top Lid mod for your PS2. For the purposes of this review though, and I think most people out there who want to play this, an emulator will suffice. Though I will note from my experience in doing so there are some minor glitches, such as certain lines of dialogue being skipped over. That was close! Wasn't it coming? <laughs> Or the rare instance like this where I can't move on because an enemy fell through the map. Ugh. Boy, I'm willing to bet any old school TF fan who booted this up for the first time got pretty darn excited when they were greeted with this intro sequence, and then subsequently confused when the names of the characters came up, calling the Autobots Cybertrons and Decepticons Destrons. Also, Convoy, Meister. Rodimus and Galvatron? Oh hell no, we're not going over that movie that ended the series again, are we? Who the heck are Chrome Dome and Weird Wolf? It's a bit sad when I think about how old school TFNs most likely saw the 86 film and chose to ignore everything that came after it. But yes, there will be a lot to absorb in this game that came from the G1 cartoon, and I do mean all of it, and not so much the first two seasons that are what most people will likely remember. Before getting underway, an interesting thing that will help any English speakers in enjoying this game in the options menu exists a means to toggle the game's primary language from Japanese to English. Yes, despite being a Japanese region exclusive game, this is playable entirely in English. Though oddly enough, this language option only affects certain texts, such as character names and subtitles. Regardless of the language select, the dialogue will always be in English, which really makes you wonder if they were willing to have an all-English voice cast from the outset. Why has the game never made it to English-speaking markets in any official capacity? That's a good question. Upon starting a new game, you are faced with your choice of allegiance and difficulty. I'll get into difficulty later, but your choice of allegiance will affect your perspective on the story, which will mostly be the same for both sides, so... I'll do my best to summarize and make note of the differences when applicable. The story begins with a tech spiel about the Transformers and their war up to this point, quickly establishing the setting of this game, Planet Zel Samin. Some days ago, the Autobots and Decepticons caught sight of a space-time rift over this planet and sent crews to investigate with no word back from them. Another crew of bots and cons, this time led by the big guys themselves, travel to the planet, experiencing some technical trouble upon arriving. This is terrible! It's broken. We need to make repairs. When the two sides catch wind of one another, a battle ensues, each accusing the other of causing the disturbance. 
That's my line, Optimus Prime! I'm in the middle of an investigation, too! When the dust settles and it becomes clear neither side knows what's happening on this planet, they retreat to their bases to attempt to analyze. The Decepticons decide to prioritize collecting energy resources to repair their space bridge by attacking various energy plants around the region, while the Autobots strike an agreement with the local government to repair their shuttle in exchange for warding off the Decepticon threat. After a series of conflicts at a wind power plant, geothermal power plant, and a dam, Why are they always so unreasonable? The Autobots and Decepticons both receive an SOS signal, believing it to be the rest of the missing crew that came before them. Upon arriving, though, they instead discover unfamiliar Transformers who claim to be from the future. I'm Prime. What? But I'm Prime! And after a scuffle, they are invited to return to their respective size bases. The future Transformers then explain that they are here on a mission to obtain a mineral known as Zell Quartz. Zell Quartz? What's that? Which is explained to be a power enhancing crystal which allowed the Decepticon Shockwave to wreak havoc in the future and thus destroy planet Cybertron itself. While Rodimus and his crew tell the present Autobots the truth, Galvatron spins a tale to his past self that the mineral is merely an essential part of an Autobot superweapon that threatens his reign over the future. And I think I'll keep quiet about Shockwave and the power of the Zell Quartz. The only problem is that while the future Transformers know what the Zell Quartz is capable of and that it comes from this planet, they don't know where exactly to find it or what it looks like. This leads to a wild goose chase, wherein the Autobots and Decepticons go after several minerals they believe to potentially be the quartz, which takes them through some ancient ruins, an oil drilling operation in the desert, and an underground mine. Can't we just kill the present day shockwave and avoid the future mutiny? No. When the search turns up fruitless, one more mineral, known as The Rock, is identified to be at the core of the enormous laser transmission array, or ELTA, facility. The Autobots and Decepticons gear up for their A-game and launch a strike at the ELTA facility, eventually reaching the core where a final confrontation between the leaders for possession of the Zell Quartz takes place. If victorious is the Decepticons, Megatron and Galvatron take possession of the Quartz and gloat to their fallen Autobot counterparts before combining their power to destroy the facility, releasing all the collected energy in a massive blast that supposedly ravages the entire planet. After the dust settles and the Autobots have retreated, Galvatron then tricks his past self into handing over the quartz, which he then intends to use for his own end in conquering the universe. <laughs> As the Autobots, both Primes manage to claim the Quartz away from their Decepticon counterparts, but Elta is already on the verge of meltdown, and to stop the reaction, both Optimus and Rodimus call upon the power of their matrices to bring the energy flow back under control. Yeah! Once done and the Decepticons have left, the remaining Autobots ruminate over how to deal with the Zell Quartz, so it can never be used again. In either scenario, it's ultimately Starscream who saves the day, by absconding with the Quartz and taking off into space, unintentionally destroying it by doing so. Zell Quartz is truly unique to this planet. If it was installed while within this planet's atmosphere, there wouldn't have been a problem. With the Quartz gone, the time stream reasserts itself and the future Transformers disappear back to their own time, leaving their pleasant comrades to return to Earth to continue their battles there and leaving Starscream stranded in space. No! The spark of thought within him went dim, and then silent. In an end analysis, the concept behind the story is quite an interesting one to explore, but in execution it just makes my balls wince. Typically I'd go complete apeshit over any plot that involves time travel as a central element since it can be an enormous headache to wrap your head around, but with some exceptions I think that element of the story runs just barely alright. Being set in the Generation 1 cartoon continuity, the present Autobots and Decepticons mostly come from the first two seasons of the series while the future Transformers come from the movie and third season of the show. Meaning that this game takes place at some point after season two is over, but before the events of the movie. While the exact time is never slated during the game itself, promotional materials suggest it probably took place in 2003, 
coinciding the in-game era with the release time of the game itself. There are aberrations to this time frame set up in the form of the Headmasters and other Headmaster era characters, which are established to come from the present era despite the fact that they would not appear until Season 4 in the Rebirth Saga. This is quite an irritating problem, since with the exception of the issue presented by the Headmasters, there's quite a lot of references to some of the original show, which means the writers at least did some research, but apparently not enough to know where the Headmaster should fit in all this. And while this problem doesn't have much effect on the overall narrative, it's still really gritting to have Prime and Megatron treat them as if they've been around this whole time whenever they're encountered. Snapdragon? Good! It's time that you were back helping me. Yes, my Lord Megatron! On the subject of the references, though, it's quite a treat to have certain characters bring up things as they become relevant, such as comparing the battle at the hydroelectric plant to the battle at Sherman Dam and more than meets the eye part two. Commander, doesn't this remind you of when we woke up on Earth? Or bringing up planet Torculon from the season three episode Web World when considering Galvatron's sanity. In which case, maybe we should have brought him here a long time ago, instead of places like that planet Torculon. On the topic of Galvatron, when Cyclonus does question him about the lie he fed Megatron, he states that he doesn't want Megatron to know of its power since he could potentially use it to destroy Unicron, thus preventing his own conversion into who he is now. Rodimus, on the other hand, hesitates to say much about the future, being aware of the fact that perhaps giving away too much may alter history far more drastically than he intends to accomplish. That is, at least until their mission is done and he does attempt to warn Optimus about a certain future indiscretion, but Optimus cuts him off before he can. But, because of me, you... That's enough, Rodimus. It's also a treat in general, just to see the interactions between the present and future characters. The Decepticons more so than the Autobots, in my opinion. Cyclonus disrespecting Soundwave and the resulting retribution he receives from doing so. I'm going to have to teach you some manners! Starscream trying to play the sycophant card to Galvatron, who remains silently amused at this since he knows he could just vaporize him. But you're nothing to worry about. If push comes to shove, I can atomize you with a single blow. It makes for some pretty good laughs. Ho 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 ho! Whatever you say, Starscream! Unfortunately, while instances like these can be very characterful, other things make you raise an eyebrow at where some of these character traits are pulled out of, such as Wheeljack and Cup ruminating over old war stories. It's also rather disappointing that despite the cast of playable characters expanding bit by bit over the course of the game, the only characters we touch off on the plot are the initial starter six bots and cons from the present, and later six bots and cons from the future. What really kills it though is the presentation. Very little, if any, of the conversations throughout the game play out as little more than a bunch of bots standing around and flapping their lips, shifting their mouth plates, or flashing their ears. Even on the rare occasion that the characters do animate, it's really stiff and stock animations that are generally shared by everyone. And to emphasize, facial expressions are absolutely non-existent. Really, if you ever wanted a prime example of dull surprise, this is one game that would never not take the cake at every turn. And the voice acting... Well, I'll get into that soon, but trust me when I say it really does no favors to the presentation either. Furthermore, the game script is chock full of weirdness. Bizarre, non sequitur, strange inconsistencies between the script and captions that all serve to just make you scratch your head. Like, what's an assault bossa? The story gets a C- minus at best, a great concept absolutely let down by the presentation and writing. Graphics and sound is a mixed bag as well. Character models are generally made to look like cartoon models in terms of details, with few small hints of toy-specific details that weren't carried over to the show, such as Jazz's shoulder wheels and door wings, or Megatron's trigger crotch. Even the transformations tend to be on the toony side with the way some designs have to squash, stretch, or basically turn inside out. Even that peculiar instance of Hot Rod's arms twisting around his back from the movie gets acknowledged in his transformation. Unfortunately, while it's nice to see some dedication to the details of rubbery cartoon physics applied here, the robot character models all carry very similar proportions. 
specifically a very super robot-esque style of smaller head and body and ridiculously long legs, which is not entirely ideal for the whole cast, and I gather the only reason they end up this way is to ensure all characters can fit the same animation skeleton. I mentioned before that cutscene animation are rather stock, but with few exceptions, this pretty much carries over to every character in the game. Even in battle, running animations, punches and kicking combos. Think of any specific type of animation in this game for any character, and aside from specific transformations, it's most likely it'll get reused somewhere. Color-wise, though, eh, well, I'm sure I could blame the PS2 for being what it is up to a certain point. It's still fairly bleak. Blasts and explosions are going to be the brightest and most vibrant colors you see here. Granted, the environmental variety also leaves something to be desired, with deserts, mountains, caves, and other indoor facilities making up most of it. There are a couple of outdoor forest slash jungle areas, but these just end up being ruined by arbitrary fog effects. Sound, on the other hand, well, the music does not sound like anything I've heard out of Transformers G1 or otherwise. It's not bad, it's just that outside of the main theme, you would probably think this kind of music may be more at home in an Atlas game, which it's not. Despite what TF Wiki seems to think, there is no proof I can find of them having any involvement. Sound effects are... well, outside of transforming noise, I don't think any of it will elicit much nostalgia, but... I think it's time for the part everyone has been waiting for, the voice acting. Now while I'm sure everyone who wanted a G1 cartoon based video game to have a cast to help sell the nostalgia home like Peter Cullen, Frank Walker, Dan Gilvesan, and maybe even Corey Burton, well, sorry. Instead, you're getting a cast of actors who are more well known for more... infamous roles. For example, the voice of Optimus Prime is Robert Belgrade, more well known for his role as the voice of Alucard in the PlayStation version of Castlevania Symphony of the Night. This castle is a creature of chaos. It may take many incarnations. Megatron and Galvatron are both voiced by Jeff Manning, who was Shaft in the same game, but you will probably remember more for Smash 64. Super Smash Brothers! But if you want a real good example, here's someone I think most of you will remember for the wrong reasons. Barry Jurd. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. Yeah. This is the kind of voice talent they brought in for this game. And past a certain point, I find the performance reasonably alright. But it's fairly clear that most of these guys were picked because they were English-speaking VAs that already worked in Japan. Well, well, well. Autobots. You've managed to make it all the way here. While somewhat awkward in the role, I think Robert Belgrade at least puts on a good effort in sounding like the type of hero you expect out of Optimus Prime. Jeff Manning, though, ugh. While I like how he sounds more like Leonard Nimoy when doing the voice of Galvatron, his act for both Megatron and Galvatron leaves a lot to be... desired. I wish I could... just... fast forward... past most of his dialogue. His task shall be... yes... I must have him take on Optimus Prime. And Primus, does he just go on and on? If you want one good reason not to revisit this game, listening to Megatron drawing out his needlessly long speeches will be it. So yeah, graphics and sound, very up and down, I'd say. More down than up, though. This is still a video game, though, so the time you spend absorbing all these characteristics has to intermingle with some degree of gameplay, so let's see if that's any more worth your time. Spoiler alert, probably not. Transformers is a 3D action brawler with RPG elements. Your purpose during each stage primarily consists of fighting off hordes of enemies in each area in order to proceed to the next one. The invisible wall seems to have disappeared. The hordes in question usually being numerous clone soldiers of various familiar faces from throughout the G1 cartoon, which raises all sorts of questions about how each side is capable of doing this. 
characters like the Insecticons, I can let it go since it was established that they clone themselves all the time. And Skywarp and Thundercracker kind of get off on the fact that the show used the Seeker character models to fill out ranks all the time. Autobots, though, seeing Ironhide, Prowl, Grimlock, and various others as generic clone soldiers is very eyebrow raising. Furthermore, because these guys are grunts, it means they aren't viable as player characters. Yeah, despite featuring a large portion of the Transformers G1 cartoon cast, you can only play as a select number of characters, which I imagine has to be one of the most gut-wrenching experiences for fans of certain characters. Wanna go rampaging around as one of your favorite Dinobots? Tough luck. They're mooks in this game. Moooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooooo
there's no way to alter the control layout, so what you see here is what you get. D-pad and left stick are for movement. Right stick is for camera movement. Press X to jump. Square to transform. Triangle punch. Circle kick. L1 block. L3 quick turn. R1 for firing mode. Tap R2 to pick up an enemy R3 change camera range. Gameplay primarily consists of your character and two allies moving from a given area of the map to the next by beating the scrap out of the hordes of clone enemies that teleport in until they are all dead. You accomplish this by stringing punches and kicks together in sequence until they fall down, wait for them to get back up, and repeat ad nauseum until you lose your mind. Okay, there's a little more variation to combat than that, such as altering the direction of the attack, but you will still be doing a lot of this. Now, as far as I can tell, there's not much of any significant offsets to punching over kicking, but kicking definitely will give you more range, and you will learn to value that. I mean, you can shoot enemies from a distance, but it means standing still, leaving yourself completely open, and wasting energy. Yeah, aside from your HP meter up there, there's also an SC and EP gauge. The FC is the spark combo meter, which fills up little by little as you fight, and can hold up to three charges. To use a spark combo, simply hold the attack button down and release it in front of an enemy and you can wail on them. Be mindful though, this can be triggered a little more easily than you might think, and only works on bots who are upright in robot mode. If an allied unit has a charged SC gauge, you can trigger a double spark combo with them. The trigger of which is even more sensitive as you simply attack the same enemy that they are targeting at the same time, which most often happens when you're not expecting it. Some double spark combos even have special variations depending on which two characters initiate it. Your EP bar is your energy for use for firing weapons, using special attacks, energy bursts, and even transforming. That's right, simply staying transformed drains EP, let alone using transformed attacks, and if you get too low you'll go right back to bot mode. Special attacks are triggered by pressing the attack buttons at the same time, making your character use their own signature maneuver to cause a lot of damage to their enemies at the cost of a chunk of EP. While you can defend yourself from the front decently enough, enemies will gang up on you all the time, and a good way to clear the air is with a 360 energy burst, by spinning the stick around and pressing the attack button. And this also costs a bit of EP. EP and HP can be regained by picking up these things dropped by enemies, but it's random, and oftentimes I find myself in a situation where I need one or the other, and of course I'm not getting it, and god damn. While it seems like all these abilities would give you a lot to work with in combat, it's really not all that helpful when all is said and done, as the controls are really stiff, too many maneuvers leave you wide open either while you're doing them or immediately after, and enemies are just relentless. Between fighting regular mooks, you might also have to deal with other irritating gimmicks like wind, fog, mines, turrets, time trials, and even bosses and mini-bosses, including big bots like Trypticon or combiners like Abominus and Raiden. Cry many this game has no shortage of things that will make you want to tear your hair out. Fighting Galvatron is bad enough, but in a bloody minefield while also warding off Ripper Snapper at every turn? You are going to die! A lot! When you do, you will be given a chance to try again from whatever the last checkpoint was at the cost of a continue, which as far as I can tell is the only thing that will change based on your difficulty. Easy makes continues unlimited, normal gives you 10, hard mode gives you 1. Run out and it's game over. Back to your last save, which I must remind you has to be done manually between levels. So. Stay on top of that. Granted, if you reload a save, your continue count will reset, so if you've used up a lot, save your game, return to the main menu and reload your save, or just do yourself a big favor and play the game on easy mode. There's really no point in doing otherwise. The enemies and challenges are going to be an absolute pain in your skid plate, no matter what. This of course assumes I can even recommend playing this game in the first place. And in all honesty, I just can't do that. Transformers Call of the Future for the PlayStation 2 is a gem if only for the nostalgia-fueled trip back to the original Generation 1 cartoon continuity. 
with characters and callbacks that any old TF fan could find all sorts of enjoyment from. However, it's just not fulfilling enough to have to put up with the layers and layers of pain that fills every single seam of this game's experience. The scenario of having Transformers from past and future coming together to prevent a catastrophe is marred by the slog of drawn-out dialogue presented by barely fitting voice casts and gameplay that's only fun in very short spurts before it becomes unbearable. Heck, replaying it isn't even worth that much. As I said earlier, you can pick up in the beginning on a completed save and pick up all the recruitable crew members on a second go through things. In addition, the middle stage has some story changes where instead of the Autobots and Decepticons coming from the future, they've intercepted a message from the Quintessons from the future about the danger of the Zell courts. And of course, it completely melts my brain to think how this could ever work canonically. In good faith, I can't recommend anyone short of hardcore fans to give this game a try, let alone attempt to track down a legitimate copy. If you really must experience this game's story, just watch my old playlists. Yes, it's all old and in poor quality, but it's all there and you won't even have to go through the pain of playing it yourself. Good gravy, that was a ramble and a half. And even then, I'm pretty sure I missed a few things, but... Whatever, I'm done with it now. Well, it may be a joyless time for me, but I certainly hope you all had a joyful time this holiday season. With that all said and done, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and until next time, RCFS, and out. Oh right, end cards. I almost forgot about these things. So here are the playlists for the game right here. And somewhere in the description are links to my Twitter, Discord, Instagram, and all that good stuff. So, yeah. Okay, bye.